uh, from time to time, I know he's expressed interest in, in joining us, and I hope you'll see more of him on our campus. We really are indebted to him for making this possible. The forum was launched in 2009 as part of an institute-wide initiative to look at new ways of fostering MIT's century-long ties with India. The initiative is led by professors Abhijit Banerjee and Charles Cooney, who launched the forum as a way to stimulate interest and knowledge about India and to discuss and debate the most pressing issues facing India and the world today. The inaugural lecture at the MIT India Forum welcomed Dr. Montek Singh Alawalia, in India's Chief Planning Commissioner, and that was back on September 9, 2009, and that generated tremendous excitement on this campus and in the greater Boston area. Future forums will continue on a quarterly basis, that's our plan, and may examine such topics as India's rapid economic and technological transformation, R&D manufacturing in South Asia, and social enterprise. Other speakers at the forum have featured Sri Kapil Sibyl, the Indian Minister of Human Resource Development, when he spoke here on October 27, 2009, on education across borders, the India perspective. And only last week, on April 14, a lecture alas, I miss Sunil Dr. Mittal spoke here in the forum to a very large audience on lessons from a first generation entrepreneur in India. He's an enormous success story and I'm told the talk was just terrific. We're grateful to him. So, the BNK Securities MIT India Forum is one of the anchors of the MIT India Initiative. The primary mission of this initiative is to foster collaboration between the faculty and students at MIT and, collaborate, and with students and faculty at academic research institutions in India. Among its specific goals are enabling the creation of long-term projects involving groups from both MIT and Indian institutions, promoting sustainable development, educational leadership, entrepreneurship, new models of governance, and advanced results-focused research in India. Let me mention just some of the major undertakings, and I'll do this very briefly, that MIT has created that engages in and with India. And I'm going to just list a few of them, hardly all we do. Uh, there is the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, known as JPAL, uh, in the MIT Economics Department, with offices, offices in Chennai and Delhi. I don't need to talk to you about poverty action. We all know what that lab has done. It's just a spectacular uh, operation. It is worldwide, but its largest enterprise is in India. Its largest set of activities are in and with India. We have the India Institute of Human Settlements Project in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. We have MISTI India. Uh, our most significant student internship that places our students in India research and development programs and which is housed at our Center for International Studies in the School of Humanities to develop our MIT India initiative. MIT presently has 280 students from India enrolled here, most of whom are graduate students, making it one of the largest and most vibrant international communities, student communities we have on campus. And at MIT there are at least 40 Indian-born faculty. I'm not talking about how many staff we have who are also Indian-born and bring tremendous knowledge and skill to our, to our campus. But just faculty alone, and 30 of those approximate 40 are directly engaged with and, and working on the MIT India issue. An enormous amount. There is no country with that many faculty at MIT with that kind of engagement around their home country. Nowhere. And it, it's really quite phenomenal. We wouldn't be here. In, in a sense, and what we do with it, if it weren't for that faculty. And that's just to say that MIT is already very active in and with India, and our plans are to increase our level of activity even more in the months and year, years ahead. Few countries are, are, are of greater interest or of greater importance to MIT than in India. Now that leads me to the very purpose of our India Forum today, and that is the wonderful opportunity to listen to and engage with India's ambassador to the United, the United States, Ms. Neera Shankar. The title of her talk is Indo-US Relations. Ambassador Shankar has had a long and distinguished career in diplomacy. She joined the Indian Foreign Service in July 1973. She has held several important assignments during her career. She served as director of the Prime Minister's Office from 1985 to 91, was posted to Washington, D.C., and served as Minister for the Commercial Area for Commerce from 1991 to 1995. So this is not her first time in Washington. Therefore, she headed the, thereafter, she headed the India Council of Culture for Cultural Relations in New Delhi, overseeing India's cultural diplomacy. 
Subsequently, in the Ministry of External Affairs, she headed two important divisions dealing with South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, SARC, S-A-A-R-C, that is, and relations with Nepal and Bhutan. After promotion to the rank of additional secretary in 2002, she held the responsibility for the United Nations and international security. Her last assignment was as ambassador of India to Germany from December 2005 until April 2009. Ambassador Shankar arrived in Washington, D.C., my hometown, on April 26, 2009. Ambassador Shankar, we're privileged to have you with us at MIT today. It's really an honor for all of us to greet and welcome you, and we look forward to hearing you. Please, if you would come to the podium, a nice round of applause for our We've seen it bounce back to 8%, and in 2010, <coughs> the financial year we just gave birth, uh, we uh, uh, achieved 8.7% growth. The projections for 2011 are 8%, uh, so we're hopeful that we would be able to sustain a high growth path of 8 to 10% for the next decade and beyond. Now, the reason we need to do this is because this is what we believe will be essential to overcoming the backlog of poverty and providing uh, decent uh, employment and opportunities to our people, particularly those at the bottom of the pyramid. Of course, growth by itself while a necessary, uh, in, uh, a necessary principle is perhaps not a sufficient principle for a developing country like India. So along with growth, we have the challenge of making it inclusive. What do we do to ensure that all sections of our people benefit from the process of growth and that it doesn't remain limited uh, to some sections of our population. Again, this is a huge challenge and one which will depend on selective government interventions, both in terms of capacity building to empower people to participate in the opportunities which are opening up, but also selective government interventions to reduce vulnerability of marginalized sections of our people. Now, we have attempted some interesting programs uh, in this regard. Uh, for instance, we have introduced a National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which provides to one person in each family deemed to be below the poverty line in the rural areas, 100 guaranteed days of employment in a year. Since we are also building rural infrastructure, undertaking water conservation projects in the villages, uh, contour land contouring, soil conservation, uh, we believe that we can provide this employment productively um, and uh, at the same time ensure that it's sustainable. Of course, there are questions uh, which have been debated you know, are we creating an unsustainable subsidy? Is this the best way to go? Should we not look at first creating infrastructure and you know, providing the environment within which people can employ themselves and so on? But at the end of the day, I think this was one of the major programs that we've undertaken to create some kind of a social safety net in rural India. And it is the presence of this safety net which helped us also, in some sense, handle uh, the poor monsoon that we had last year, where there was a, a shortfall in food production and uh, food inflation. But because of the safety net that we had put in place in rural India, the impact was less severe than it otherwise could have been. Uh, we are also experimenting with uh, some health insurance schemes uh, for the poorer people, particularly in rural India, where access to health and medicines uh, can be 
uh, uh, somewhat limited. And these are very low-cost insurance schemes which provide for coverage for major operations for the family and so on. Some of the states have introduced this. I don't know how it will expand to the rest of India and what our experience would be, but it's very much uh, uh, you know, in uh, uh, churning of ideas as to how we could make these interventions in ways which are both economically sustainable and at the same time achieve the social objectives uh, that we hope that they will. Um, when you look at the Indian economy, you see that initially it's the services and information technology sectors which really were the first to take off after the liberalization in India. And that was because they didn't really need a great deal of infrastructure. They needed human capital and uh, taking advantage or leveraging the huge changes in communications technology and the availability of human, cap human skills in India. Indian companies were able to create a new segment of the economy which became the first engine of growth. Uh, in India. It also linked up with the global economy because the interesting thing in India has been till now that the IT sector is very, um, uh, has islands of excellence which are on par with the best in the world but it has been primarily linked globally and the backward penetration of IT into the Indian economy is still in an incipient stage though we are seeing this beginning to happen. Um, I think for India, it is a challenge to ensure that growth doesn't occur only in one sector and that we build a broad-based economy because a country as populous as India cannot build its economy only on one leg. So there were these kind of facile uh, observations that India could perhaps skip the stage of the industrial revolution or manufacturing and move straight to a services economy, uh, which of course is, is certainly not uh, sufficient for the challenges that India faces of this huge population to whom gainful employment has to be provided. So we need to build our economy not just on the services sector, but by building manufacturing and uh, uh, industrial capacity, as also uh, catalyzing uh, the next leap in productivity in the agricultural economy. I think I would call it a policy of building the economy <coughs> on three legs, with each of these legs playing their role in balancing the Indian economy. Uh, today, as I said, the IT sector has grown enormously. Um, I think it's uh, you know starting from a period where their exports used to be about 200 uh, million dollars. They are now well over 50 million dollars worth of exports. I think they were somewhere in the region of uh, maybe even 60 million dollars this year, um, uh, and uh, it's poised to grow. It will move up the value chain and the nature of operations that will be done in India will become more sophisticated with a greater emphasis on innovation rather than just uh, wage arbitrage. Uh, and uh, also we will see new knowledge sectors like biotechnology, bioinformatics, etc., which will also emerge and develop very fast. In the area of manufacturing, when we opened up the Indian economy, uh, we found that many of our companies really went under because they had been used to a protected environment, uh, post-independence, protected by industrial licensing internally and by high tariff walls externally. So uh, prior to 91, it was really a seller's market in India. And I illustrate this by, you know, by, by pointing out that India 
was manufacturing an automobile in the 50s, well before South Korea manufactured its first automobile. The only difference being that by the 80s, India was still manufacturing the same automobile, the, uh, the ambassador car. Now, I don't know if you've seen the ambassador car, I have nothing against it. It's a good car and it feeds the nostalgia market and some are even being exported back to the UK from where we had originally um, uh, adapted the model. Uh, and it's the preferred car of many pop stars to arrive at functions, you know, all souped up in a psychedelic fashion. But clearly, you know, it, it was, uh, uh, it, you know, uh, a part of old India which continues and it's very charming because it continues but today there are many other choices. Uh, you know, some of our industrialists at that stage complained to the government saying, why are you opening up so fast? You are forcing us to run before we have learned to walk. But because of the opening up, they were forced to actually restructure themselves. And many have emerged competitive in, uh, in several sectors. The automobile sector itself has undergone a huge transformation, not only with many foreign players who have entered the Indian market, you know, whether it is South Korea, uh, the Hyundai, or whether it is now the German car manufacturers who were the last to come in, or the <coughs> Japanese Toyota or Nissan. They're all there and active in the Indian marketplace. <laughs> what is interesting is that Indian players have emerged in the automobile sector. For instance, the Tatas, uh, who have now a whole stable of indigenously designed cars, from the Indica uh, to the Indigo to the Marina, and of course, their Nano, which uh, changed the paradigm of automobile production by um, uh, producing a car uh, which will cost probably the least in the world. I mean, it changes because the cost of inputs have gone up. But one which has sufficiently sophisticated engineering <coughs> in terms of fuel efficiency and uh, meeting sustainable norms. Uh, the Nano itself generated over 30 patents uh, for Tata's and uh, in a sense set the pace for other car manufacturers in India. So today we see that India has become the largest global hub for producing small fuel efficient cars and every car manufacturer in the world is making small cars in India. For instance, Suzuki um, has their biggest global hub for producing small Suzukis in India. Hyundai is exporting some of its small cars that they make in India. Uh, Mahindra's is another company, Indian company, uh, which has emerged in the SUV segment. And their car, the Scorpio, perhaps provides the best value for money in this segment. Indeed, when I was ambassador in Germany, the German ambassador, and this is helping, for instance, uh, deal with the issue of AIDS in Africa. Uh, President Clinton, at one of the lectures that he was giving, was explaining how he worked with Indian producers of medicines to give them a stable market in Africa, but as a result of their lower prices, for the same value, he was able to treat you know, uh, so many more patients, maybe three to four times the number of patients that he could afford to do with that same amount of money uh, without uh, the cheaper drugs from India. Um, similarly, if you take a look at some of the infrastructure sectors, such as cement and steel, um, India is, is uh, acquiring capabilities and becoming competitive. One characteristic which you will notice you know, from the car segment is that India has a focus on low-cost high-tech manufacturing or what is called frugal engineering 
And this is driven by the nature of the market. So we are coming up with cost-effective solutions, products, systems designed to service a market <coughs> where there isn't a lot of cash available with people. And at the same time, people want products which are on par with products which are available throughout the world. So many companies are finding that if they can innovate products in India which are acceptable in the Indian market, they have a market throughout the developing world. Com companies such as Honeywell are using India for development of technological solutions which are low cost and which have relevance and applicability across a much broader spectrum of the developing world. Um, in the agricultural sector, to take the third leg, which I said we need to stand on, we are facing challenges because uh, uh, about 60% of our people depend on agriculture for, a livelihood, for their livelihood. But the share of agriculture in the GDP has been coming down. And it's uh, you know, something like 16%, maybe even less. Uh, so the challenge for us is how do we ensure that we can catalyze the next leap in agricultural productivity? The Green Revolution, uh, which uh, of course uh, uh, was uh, ushered in with US support, has plateaued. And we now have to look at how we can you know, have productivity gains. Um, we believe that this will require uh, developing food processing, developing the logistic supply chains, and building the backward and forward linkages between the rural economy and the urban industrial economy. Uh, so this is going to be one of the challenges that we have. We made, we made a beginning. And, uh, but we need to accelerate this. I think other areas would be dry zone agriculture, which requires less water for, for uh, irrigation or for agriculture, uh, horticulture, and so on. But the key would be really <coughs> agribusinesses and food processing, uh, where we are still at a very uh, low level. In fact, a lot of our food uh, and uh, vegetables are wasted because of inadequate food processing facilities. But till we create that logistical infrastructure, uh, uh, I think the food processing industry uh, will uh, not be able to take off in the way in which we hope it will. <clears throat> so this is a key focus of government's efforts today. Uh, and last year, <coughs> In 2010, we had very good growth in agriculture of over 4%, but that was on the basis of a relatively poor performance the previous year. So in some sense, the growth gets distorted. Um, overall, I would say that we're optimistic that we would be able to develop a broad-based uh, economy, which will have uh, these three pillars as its basic foundation, uh, services, manufacturing, and agriculture. Now, what are the challenges that we face in terms of achieving uh, our objectives? I would say there are two major challenges. One is the whole area of physical infrastructure, which uh, uh, is inadequate uh, below global uh, levels to start with and hasn't been able to keep pace with the demands of a fast growing economy. But this is also a thing is that um, the private sector in India has finally begun to invest in the power sector. When the reforms took place, we opened up the power sector you know, generation to private investment, including 100% foreign direct investment. The government didn't invest for that plan period because they signed all these MOUs with 
over 100 companies and so on, and they expected that private sector investment would flow in. It didn't because there were other policy issues uh, with regard to the Indian market. And many of these private sector players were demanding central government guarantees for their projects, which really was not possible for the government to do because it would have become sovereign debt for the government. And the whole issue of privatizing or giving this to the private sector would have been defeated if at the end of the day, all of that became sovereign government debt. So it didn't really move. And for a long time, there was this question whether a sector which takes such heavy investment and this long gestation and which has you know, political risks of managing a market, a public market, uh, would really be attractive to the private sector. But today, almost 50% of the new capacities which are under construction in the power sector are from private sector investors. Mainly Indian, we haven't had that much of public investment. But you know, the interesting thing is that new Indian players are emerging in the sector and they are investing and doing this effectively. But it's a sector which still requires a lot of uh, a lot of journey to traverse. Um, but because we will have to invest in these sectors, it will also provide an engine of growth in the Indian economy for several years to come because urban infrastructure, roads, rails, port, railways, ports, airports, I mean the whole infrastructure uh, portfolio uh, will be in a state of development for you know, the next decades. Um, the second challenge that we face is of uh, is, is of social development. Um, how do you ensure that uh, people are able to participate actively in the economy? Uh, and here I think, as I said, the government is investing heavily in the education sector, uh, whether it is school education or um, vocational training or higher education. We are seeing a big step up in government outlays from around 8% of government spending to around 19% of government spending. So it's a huge jump in the kind of money that the government will be investing in education. There are challenges in terms of how to deliver a better quality education, particularly in the 600,000 villages that are spread across India. We hope that technology will enable us to leapfrog some of the challenges that we face um, in delivering these services. Uh, we are trying to build broadband connectivity to uh, uh, first, you know, as a knowledge network amongst all the universities and libraries and academic institutions in India, but also in the next phase with um, to all the villages in India. And this will enable us to more effectively use tools of distance education uh, to devise standardized uh, lectures and classroom studies for students even in the remotest village. Uh, we have at the moment Dr. Sam Petroda who has been appointed as the advisor of the Prime Minister on infrastructure, and this is not infra physical infrastructure per se, but essentially infrastructure for better delivery of government services. I mentioned to you that India is attempting to do all this within the framework of a very, very robust democracy. So we have to move not just on the basis of economic rationality, but also on the basis of political and social sustainability. Now, at some time, sometimes this has been criticized as being slow, but I think inner democracy uh, consensus amongst competing stakeholders is an important objective. Uh, and when we look at the success that we have achieved 
<laughs> despite you know, following an incremental approach, it gives us the confidence that as we move ahead, uh, we will be able to make progress uh, within this framework of intense debate and discussion. One good thing is that there really isn't um, a difference in terms of the overall objective of economic policy and the overall approach. Uh, the whole reform program began under Narasimha Rao as a minority Congress government. It was carried forward by a coalition of regional parties under David Lauder, was carried forward under a coalition led by the BJP uh, under Mr. Vajpayee, it's been carried forward uh, under, in a coalition led by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. So irrespective of the composition of government, governments in India, I think that they have embraced this approach, that is we need growth, uh, we need to have a more market-oriented approach, but at the same time, combine it with selective government intervention for uh, social development. Uh, the differences are really in terms of prioritizing what needs to be done and nuancing uh, what needs to be done, how far to go and how do we, uh, in, in what sequence do we do things, what is more important than the rest. And those are normal and healthy debates in any democracy. At the same time, of course, we've seen that the changes in the economy are also leading to changes in the polity because you've seen uh, a greater devolution of economic decision making to the states. You know, like the US, we have a, a, a federal polity. It's a quasi federal polity because there's a division of powers between the center and the states. But residual powers rest with the center. In the US, I don't think that's the case. Um, in some areas, of course, like law and order, we have more stringent norms because the center can send in you know, uh, central police forces only at the request of the state government. Or if the governor, who is a nominal appointee, uh, certifies that there's been a breakdown of the constitutional machinery, that is the government has collapsed or you know, uh, whatever. So those norms are quite stringent, but this dynamic in terms of center-state relations is never static. It's a constantly moving one in terms of where the locus of authority and power shifts. And clearly you're seeing uh, a greater shift in terms of economic authority uh, to the states, uh, greater decentralization of decision making. And you see this in the fact that the states which are well governed are really doing well and their economy is taking off. And then there are states which are not doing so well and which need to be the focus of sustained attention. But of course, if you have this competition amongst the states, uh, our hope is also that there is a demonstration effect, you know, in terms of, say, a state like Bihar, which was lagging for a long time. And now it has begun to turn around because it sees that other states and people in other states are so much better off. So we are seeing that even in some of the states which have the worst record, uh, change is now beginning to be discernible, both in terms of economic growth and in terms of the but I think the whole world has a stake in India's success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shantar. I think we have some time for questions and comments. Uh, I only ask that we try to keep them as succinct and brief as possible so others will have a chance. Uh, yes, please. I'll try to call you when I see your hands, OK? Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, yeah, so my question is about healthcare delivery. Um, obviously, there's um, <clears throat> a lot of people in the country and not tons of doctors. Um, so I'm curious to know the commitment that the government's making um, to either telemedicine or mobile health in general, um, either with, with financial support or you know, commitments to you know, looking at 
technologies that you disseminate to NGOs. Um, just love to hear your thoughts and comments on that. Yeah, I think this is a sector where uh, we need to invest quite quite heavily. Um, you know, we have a system where theoretically there's free healthcare for anyone. You know, you can go to a government hospital and get yourself checked out. And you have to pay for the cost of medicine, but the checking out is free. But then capacities have not kept pace with demand, and uh, the number of government facilities are far fewer than the number of people who want to use them. Uh, the government then uh, adopted a different model, saying, OK, let private sector providers also come up in the health sector so that those who can afford uh, to pay for health services will go to these private sector providers and maybe that will be more sophisticated, but that would ease some of the pressure on the government system. So you have now uh, private sector healthcare providers such as Apollo or Batra or um, uh, uh, escorts, you know, which is in the field of heart uh, surgery and heart care, cardiac care, uh, which really are very good and on par with the best in the world. Uh, at the district and block and village levels, I think the government has tried to create health centers, but also at the village level uh, to have uh, what are called Anganwadi workers. These are, you know, what you could call barefoot uh, health personnel who uh, help uh, uh, with day-to-day -day issues. Uh, we do have uh, the ability now, we are looking at as part of this overall program for better delivery of government services and also using telemedicine so that people in the village would not need to travel to the city but would be able to link up with some of the major hospitals to get diagnosis and, and treatment. And we do also have mobile clinics uh, which go, uh, 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 for instance, uh, GE has developed a mobile uh, ECG machine uh, which is quite cheap and which can be carried, and this was built in India, which can be carried to the villages and can easily undertake the tests there. So all these are being attempted. I think the issue really is the scalability and scaling up because the scale on which it needs to be done is huge. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, what about your uh, path towards where you are right now? And if uh, you are not from IAS or IPS or IFS background, is there a path to get work your way up to where you are? Or uh, also about your job? What are the main challenges? And what do you do if your personal opinions differ from the party's agenda or mandate? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me um, say that you know um, I am a professional diplomat, so I entered the foreign service and uh, joined. But uh, the government uh, does uh, look at uh, getting in, you know, advisors in various capacities. <coughs> there are economic advisors, there are technical advisors, and there are also political appointees who are uh, diplomats or ambassadors. But those are normally at the highest level, that is at the level of ambassadors. So I think the ability to participate in, in India, I think, is quite, quite big because at the moment the demands also for uh, expertise, talent, skills is so large. Um, for instance, the new IITs that we are creating, you know, the new IIMs that we are building, the new institutes of science and research that we are building, we face a capacity crunch. So we're really very keen that people who are studying or doing their doctorates overseas look at the possibility of going back uh, to these institutions and making them really world-class institutions. Uh, right now, as I said, the, it, there's an expansion of everything because we are still in the process of building the capacities, building the infrastructure. So there's a demand for, for everything. Please. Uh, thank you for your talk. You, you um, suggested in your talk that over the two decades and actually almost three decades of uh, economic liberalization that the GDP has been very high and this uh, somehow translates to the 
uh, improvement <coughs> of the conditions of life. Uh, but that link is not made very clear. So, I was, um, for example, if you look at the evidence over the last 30 years, the actual number of poor and vulnerable people, and it's two times the uh, poverty line who do 750 rupees per month uh, expenditure, has decreased only 3% from 81% to 7%. So, there's 77% of people still very poor, although in, in spite of two decades of phenomenal economic growth. Uh, so, if there is no evidence that three decades of liberalization has improved the condition, how, why uh, should we believe that it's going to improve in the future? And to give you an example, I want to uh, draw your attention to the condition of contract workers. In Chhattisgarh, you said that states look at each other and then uh, think that this state is attracting investment. But it's actually true that the states who are attracting the highest investment also have the highest human rights abuses and low socioeconomic indicators. Uh, like Chhattisgarh, for example, uh, almost 74% of uh, contract of cement workers in Chhattisgarh are contract workers, and foreign companies which are coming in are actively resisting and uh, suppressing organizing among labor unions. And if the people and these these, these people have come from agriculture and they're, they're the poorest of the poor, and if they are not allowed to, because of this this euphemism called uh, pro, uh, you know providing a favorable investment climate actually means not allowing people to organize into or formalizing them as workers so what is the government doing exactly uh, if that has it has not done in the last uh, 30 years uh, going forward and how are we uh, to hold the government accountable for that i think that you know if you look at overall per capita income it has increased uh, quite substantially during this period uh, the middle class has grown. I mean, it's now set to number about 300 million people, maybe more. Uh, so if you look at a population of 1.1 million, it means that there are still many people who are poor, but that's a backlog of poverty that we have and that we need to address. You raise the issue of how we can be sure that liberalization will enable us to do this. Uh, but I would say that when we didn't have growth, post-independence, and we followed that policy for, you know, from 1947 to 1999, so 50 years, we found that without growth, we were just subdividing the cake, and the slice for each segment and each person was just getting smaller. So without growth, you won't be able to achieve even better distribution, because what you are distributing will just keep getting smaller and smaller. Then I also said that growth by itself, while it necessary, is not a sufficient principle. And therefore, we have a policy of selective government intervention, <coughs> both in terms of uh, empowering people through capacity building, and or better delivery of government services, and at the same time, creating social safety nets to reduce vulnerability. For instance, the whole National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is something which has just been there in the last several years, we introduced it as a, a pilot project on 200, in 200 of the poorest districts in India, and eventually extended it across the whole of India. So it is a huge paradigm shift in terms of the kind of programs that people are running. Now we also have what is called the unique national identity card scheme, which has commenced where we will give a, a computer, computerized uh, ID card to uh, each uh, individual, uh, which will enable the delivery of government services directly to that individual. For instance, if under the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, some payments have to be made, you could do it directly to that person's account, cutting out a lot of the wasted and leakage uh, inside. So I think it has to be a combination approach, both in terms of fostering growth, in terms of fostering social development, and in terms of using technology to leapfrog some of the challenges that we have. Kind of related to the previous question, you did mention, uh, you know, how economic growth needs to be, you know, followed, pursued in a climate of democracy. But I mean, over the last 10 years or 20 years of, you know, track record, it just seems that, you know, uh, the si the situation in terms of democracy in India is getting like worse by the day in terms of human rights abuses by the government when it 
tries to uh, you know acquire lands for all these development projects and all of that. I had a very specific question. For instance, like I, I think many people here would know of this example, the Bhopal gas disaster. Uh, and, and so, I mean, it's one of the biggest industrial disasters in the history of the planet. And the survivors in Bhopal, they've been fighting for 26 years now to get you know, basic medical attention, basic drinking water cleanup, and also to bring the, those who are guilty, the company who is, which is Dow Chemicals, which is guilty for the disaster, bring them to justice, right? So, I mean, what has the Indian government done to ensure the protection of these people? And I mean, I mean, you know, a lot of us, we actually think of this as one of the examples to see, you know, how democracy in India functions. So if people who are fighting for 26 years to get clean drinking water do not get a drop of clean drinking water, I would be very hesitant in calling it a functioning democracy. Well, I don't know if, uh, you know, there are always uh, uh, different perspectives uh, on an issue and uh, clearly we do need to ensure that uh, 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 the victims uh, or those who have suffered in Bhopal are adequately compensated. In fact, uh, it is our, um, you know, the judgment which was given uh, on the Bhopal case, I think which caused considerable public outrage in India. And um, uh, I think the government has taken the view that they will look at undertaking the cleanup of that area. Earlier it was an issue whether it is the company which has to do it or the government will do it, who is responsible for it. But I think the government has decided that they will put forward their, uh, and, and you know, that other issue can be, you know, taken up separately, but they will uh, look at uh, doing this. Um, and in the, in, in over these years, I think quite a lot of compensation has also been given uh, to those who suffered, but clearly uh, more uh, is required and should be done. Uh, I don't agree with you that, you know, in these years democracy has worsened. I think we have a far more vigilant media, we have a far more vigilant civil society uh, and groups like yours who agitate uh, on all these issues. So I think that it has actually become a far more participative democracy because of the changes uh, which have taken place, both in terms of broadening the political base, decentralization of decision making, and in terms of the much more vigorous media, which keeps an eye on whatever is happening. Please. Uh, you brought up the point that the framers of the constitution put in the reservation clause of 23.5%, but they also hoped that it would go down in the future, but it has only gone up. Do you think the government has a plan of, of a time scale when it will start coming down, or will it ever come down? Well, at the moment, I think it's still at the stage where, uh, you know, identity politics uh, is very much uh, uh, at the a core of political mobilization in India. And much of this mobilization, because of the nature of our economy, has also been taking place in terms of mediating, uh, you know, uh, benefits within the government system. But as the economy expands beyond the bounds of government, I'm sure that pressures for reservation uh, will also come down. I think there's a fine balance which needs to be maintained between in, you know, encouraging talent and merit and between uh, you know, affirmative action for socially disadvantaged groups. It's not always easy to get that right balance and societies tend to pull in one direction or the other. I think at the moment uh, it's pulled very much in the direction of reservation. But I think that as the economy broadens and you know the sphere outside government increases, pressures will reduce. Does, is there a time scale? Ten years, twenty years? Uh, I can't. Years? I can't. Yeah. I'm not an astrologer. Gentlemen in the red dress. Yes. Ambassador Shankar, uh, as an Indian, I'm very proud that we're growing at eight to nine percent. But uh, uh, and while macroeconomists sort of disagree on exactly how much how much of that GDP growth is sustainable exactly in, in, in raw numbers, um, there's a lot of concern about the inflation uh, uh, 
because it's affecting people differentially. The people who could not afford things before have, uh, are not able to afford these things more now, now that we have uh, such inflation. And there are various views that uh, the, uh, the monetary policy that the Reserve Bank has uh, um, uh, is, is not helping because we've raised interest rates six times in the last uh, whatever time. So what are your views on, on, on who you, first of all, do you, do you agree that 8 to 10 percent is sustainable over a long period of time, five to 10 years? Number two, what are some of the things that we could be doing to, uh, to help this? I do think 8 to 10 percent growth is sustainable over a period of time. I think there are several reasons. One is that the Indian savings rate has been in the region of 34 to 36 percent. Uh, similarly, the investment rate has been in the region of 36 to 38 percent. Uh, I think on the savings side, we would probably need to up it to about 40 percent <coughs> to get a 10 percent growth rate. And that's feasible. Uh, so given this, I think it is possible that we will be able to sustain a growth rate of 8 to 10 percent. I think the other factor is that the market is expanding because more people are being pulled into the middle class. And then we have a young demographic where, um, you know, the overwhelming <coughs> majority of our people are below 25 years of age. So as these people come into the working um, age group, uh, their energy will provide, a, and their consumption will provide a motor for expansion of demand in the Indian market. We'll also have to undertake the whole process of infrastructure development. So you're looking at a number of factors which will pull uh, growth in India. Yes, inflation has become a concern since uh, last year. It was a the role of philanthropy which is happening right now in other That's one of the things we are discussing right now to have food, uh, a legislation for food security, which would entitle people to get uh, food grains and access to food uh, at much cheaper and subsidized rates. The question now is who should be entitled or should it be, you know, uh, or, you know what kind of scheme do you devise? So it's very much an active part of the national debate right now. Yeah. A corporate social responsibility it's been a tradition in India in the past, but giving has been of a more personalized, individual nature rather than an institutionalized nature. And I think that's the transition we need to make in terms of, of uh, institutional. Taking my question, I really enjoyed your talk, Ambassador. Um, I just want to go back to the Bhopal issue because it seemed like when you answered that, you kind of said like you know the government is trying to compensate for the victims. It seems like letting go of the corporates. Uh, I, I feel like you're in a good position as, a, as, the mo as the largest democracy and in a country of the oldest democracy, you're well positioned to actually look at it as a more, you know, like we should look at the corporate social responsibility that they have towards the Bhopal gas victims. Uh, for example, recently Dow Chemicals gave an endowment fund to MIT. So some of us were like, you know, thinking about how, the, how does it play, like, you know, what is your view, how do you react to it, when we know clearly that Dow actually has a liability in Bhopal. So maybe this question is both for the provost and to you, like, how, how do you view this? Well, you know, I think that what the government has done is to say, okay, that issue we will pursue separately, but we won't hold up, uh, you know, investing and clearing the area, because otherwise then people suffer. So I think in some senses it's a practical approach because you can get into a theoretical position where you know you actually impact adversely on the lives of people. So I think it's a good practical decision. And at the other end of the spectrum, I would say that we need to be more conscious in terms of how we frame our liability legislation, in terms of how we sign contracts, you know, we really haven't had much of a culture. I mean, if you look at when I deal with, uh, with American companies, you know, you have a battery of providers who will pour over every comma, full stop, semicolon in the contract, and there will be so many clauses. And many Indians without really, um, both government and otherwise, without really much experience at that stage when this happened, of uh, international business 
and business norms of what you need to do to protect your interests, what clauses you need to put. So I think it's very important for us to develop all this expertise so that we can create the instrumentalities whereby we're in a better position to protect our interests. So, Ambassador Shankar, before we give you some applause, which you certainly deserve, you've given us a tremendous lecture. You ranged far and wide in a very short period of time. You can see many of the people asking our students here at some level. I don't know you all. Some may be on the faculty or postdocs, but there is so much interest in India, and we, we ourselves want to get engaged. We're just delighted you're here and helping MIT to think through what it can do with and in India. So please, please come back to us soon. Mm -hmm.